Disruptors and Curious Minds, CEOs, founders, book lovers. Welcome to the Thinking on Paper Book Club. I'm Mark, this is Jeremy, and as ever, we're here to read between the lines, to use each other and our community to get deeper insight from the books that we're reading, to make sense of things that don't make sense, especially as regards to this month's book, The Order of Time by Carlo Rivelli. We're on chapters seven and eight, which I think is probably part five if you're on Spotify or Apple. Have you recovered from last week's episode with our special guest, Leon, yet, Jeremy? I have, man. I have. I thought, uh, yeah, it was a, what a blast. Was, what a blast. Nice deep dive into into quantum mechanics and um, just a. Re- I've been a bit of a, you know, dork on that stuff. You know, I, I definitely um, am not a physicist, but I'm a, a great appreciator of explanations of complex things and um got into that pretty good but it was nice it was nice having a guest we should do more guests hey guys like yeah. jump in to these boxes with us and and have some fun we had a blast man he was fun wasn't he like a funny kind of sharp smart at the same time <laughs> not taking any prisoners <laughs> oh man yeah he, he, shots fired uh across the bow <laughs> that's for sure um yeah, related to the... some some individuals but uh no it was good it was good i'm glad he was here uh So chapter seven, the inadequacy of grammar. I've been telling English teachers for years how grammar was inadequate. They just did not listen to me, Mark. Well, bombshell, I used to be an English teacher for a a long time, um, essentially teaching English as a second language. So focusing heavily on the grammar, the past, the future, the present, the future perfect, the past perfect, the present continuous, the and how they what's funny being we'll get to this in a minute but as an english teacher speaking to french people french grammar is different to english grammar and obviously eastern european grammar is different to the the latin languages you go to japanese you go to mandarin there they'll have different grammar so even the name of this chapter the inadequacy of grammar is a, an apt title because grammar itself is so inadequate for what it's supposed to do did you see me like start shuddering and slightly convulsing when you started saying like past perfect present? I mean, just I, I've got uh, I've I just remember sitting in English class uh, struggling with that. I love the English like reading and learning stories, but like the math of the math of writing, the math of reading uh, always got to me. That's what I called grammar. The present perfect. So the present perfect reading this chapter. So when you're trying to explain what the present perfect is, like I have been, have played, have seen, whatever. This, where the past, something happens in the past, but it has an effect or an influence or some kind of residue on the present. And if only I'd had this book when I was trying to teach that, and I could have just said, forget the present perfect because there is no past, past, present or future. Oh my God, it would have been... Would have been a hell of a lot easier, right? So, so a couple quick things to kick us off. So, just the title of it alone is is kind of interesting, right? It's funny, it's funny that the idea of not having the words to explain really complex things because complexity always begins with simplicity, right? You know, little things are made of, or big things are made of little things, and so it's like I started thinking, like, where does it get away from us? Where do things get so complex that we don't actually have the Lego blocks to explain what they are? Is that, is that a question? Right, be straight away. I, I guess um, language itself is inadequate. The grammar is inadequate, but the words are in, in, inadequate. The verbs are inadequate. I mean, so in part seven, he starts with this idea of presentism and philosophers call presentism the idea that only the present is real, that the past and the future are not, and that reality evolves from one present to another successive one. Okay, And then he debunks that. That can't be the way that it works. Um, and then he moves on to eternalism and the block universe. So the block universe is what, Jeremy? I'll let you explain. Yeah, so it's, it's it, this was, I was like, I started reading this and as I was reading it, I'm like, this can't be right. And then he eventually debunks it as well, which was, which was good just for my sanity speak. But, um, you know, all of space That's time. Because like, I, I kind of got the block universe i was happy with the block universe and when he debunked i was like oh it was nice neat it was nice neat and tidy right (laughs) nice little packages of like really so all of space time existing together in its entirety without anything changing nothing really flows it was was the kind of the block universe and that that it's one single moment and changing from moment to moment is an illusion how the hell could that work 
How the hell could that possibly work? Well, everything just is. It's all there. It, it, that's, it, that gives us fate. That gives us d- d- predeterminism. Everything is there and it just exists. And there is no um, separation from any point in time. It's all just one time. Okay, so that that makes a hell of a lot more sense to me now. So one giant bucket that is just is. It is. I mean, that, that's how I understood the block universe, but um, he, he debunked it anyway. All right, so we've debunked two philosophical constructs uh, in like- We the must first... add that we're like in his opinion. Sure, sure. Yeah, there'll be some philosophers just like there were some physicists chiming in in the thread. You guys are completely incorrect, which we love. Please correct us because we are not physicists, right? Yeah. Um, so, all right. So we got through those two things. I think they probably knew that. <laughs> potentially, potentially. So the one, there, there was one sentence that stood out to me in, in chapter seven, change does not follow a global order. And I don't know if that was a, my digestion of a sentence or I'm just reading my notes here. I'm not looking at the book necessarily, but change does not f- follow a global order, meaning a central conductor of the symphony of time, right? Uh, which we know, which we've heard, but I, I just, that was really interesting to kind of, uh, no one is the gigantic architect of interconnected change. Does this kind of mirror what we were talking about the other day about the idea of there being no present and your present is only relative to you and your immediate space in time and wherever you go, it's not the same. Right. Exactly right. Exactly right. So let's talk about grammar. Let's talk about two words. One's an adjective and one's a verb, right? The adjective is real. Not that it's a real adjective, but the adjective is real. Yeah. And the verb is exists. And what Ravelli says when we when we say, hey, what is real or what exists? He looks at it as a grammatical question and not one of nature, which I think is really, really interesting because existing can have multiple definitions. Existing applies to the th- or to exist applies to the thing that is existing. So like a law can exist. This hat can exist. Um, A highway system can exist. An idea can exist, right? But they're all different definitions of what it means to exist. I can exist. A highway doesn't have a heartbeat or lungs. I do, right? I have what's called life. Does a highway have a life, right? It's ambiguous. It's right. Grammar is in the mind of the beholder. I mean, you can, what is real for you is not real for me. What can be real for a child is not the same for me. Yeah, he uses the example of Pinocchio. Of course, it's real. I mean, it's Pinocchio. Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. So then then he talks about the discovery of nature being gradual, right? We slowly but surely, the smartest minds in the world start to uncover and unlock the, 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 what nature is, right? And nature has always been, you know, nature has always been. We're just now figuring it out. Nature is the block universe, baby, right? But like, we're just starting to figure it out. But our language, our building blocks, our words, our letters, our, our, our stringing together of words and letters isn't there to do that. Why not? Because, I mean, there's only, English is quite a populated language, like half a million words or something. Most, I think, I read somewhere, if you read a copy of the New York Times, there's literally 800 words. And they're all repeated in any one edition. We just don't have the oh, vocabulary wow. to to describe things. That's why we have emotions and feelings and senses, I guess, to add layers to the the, the sheer inadequacy of words. As I'm demonstrating now, I don't even have the words to describe what I'm trying to say, let alone describe time. And I think he, on page 99, he says, we must not allow ourselves to be confused by an inadequate grammar. And I think that... For me personally, that a lot of what we're reading here is just just refuse to be confused and maybe just accept certain concepts and ideas as is and and accept that, that we don't have the vocabulary and the grammar to really explain the passage of time or the non-passage of time. And, and yeah. This yeah, this kind of hit me too. So he he mentioned that his, you know, that our grammar is organized around absolute distinctions, especially related to time, right? The past, the present, the future, right? These 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 um, hard stop moments as defined by our language, right? Where they're not hard stop moments. And, and I, I started thinking, I was like, because we think about the blurry existence that he talks about 
of these interactions and relationships that we don't have the the ability to perceive, we need to get better at uh, living in and understanding these in between states versus and these blurry existences versus these absolutes that are approximations. They're not even they're not even like what it is, right? <laughs> they're just comfy little buckets that we like to tell ourselves that things fit into. Yeah, um, we we should get uh, some kind of linguist on the the show at some point to speak about the evolution of grammar. Um, I, I'm gonna. I don't know if it's Mandarin. It might be might be Japanese. It might be a completely different of the language. But they don't even have past, present, and future. They don't have grammar. They have a word, and then so they might say today. And then what follows is the same as if you say, so today I, I, today I go to work, yesterday I go to work, three years ago I go to work, in 10 years I go to work. And they, they use this indicator of time hmm. to, to, to say when they're talking about, and then what comes next is the same regardless. Whereas English, you know, I will go, I am going, I went, that doesn't have the same, I'm sure that there's other language, who knows what Eskimos say. Sounds like sounds like the smarter way to approach it. Yeah, um, perhaps, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, and then it just kind of goes back to this this you know grammar organized around an absolute distinction where uh, past and future are relative to a particular present, right? Your past and future are relative to your present. Mine is to mine, right? And there's all of these different versions of that that are all collecting. We talk about more in chapter eight. Like there was a great definition of how that all runs together. But my last thought on chapter seven. And I actually drew a drew a little drawing and like from a perspective, I don't know if this will even this will even come up as visible. But the idea that like, you know, on this rock that we're sitting on, you know, this 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 planet that we're sitting on, you know, my up is someone else's down and my down is someone else's up. Where did I draw this? I just I just it just hit me in such a way, almost like when he oh, here it is. I don't know if you can. Look there oh man there yeah yeah yeah. right see it and i was like it that hit me just even though i know that like i know that but i don't think about that a lot just like when i'm watching the sunset i don't think about the earth rotating away from stuff and it's it's it was a cool perspective to kind of to kind of land on there i like i like your drawing makes it makes it clearer you know a picture tells a thousand words or something um so chapter eight, dynamics as relation, sooner or later, the exact measurement of our time will resume and we'll be on the ship that's bound for the bitterest shore. Um, how to, def- okay, we're getting into quantum gravity equations, loop gravity equations here. So I don't think we're gonna actually going to recite any of these equations, but essentially... He oh, now, I planned on it. I yeah, planned okay. on doing you a whole also, whiteboard. You, you go, that's why we do book clubs, so you can go deeper and use other people's ideas and thoughts to understand it more. Um, he starts with the idea of removing time itself from the equations that physicists use to calculate the universe. So essentially, you remove the variable time, and then you remove that, then how do you make formula? How do you make these hypotheses work? And he uses the work of two of his friends, Bryce DeWitt and John Wheeler, to, they were the first to try to formulate quantum theory without using time. And then he goes into a wormhole himself of nostalgia for his friends. But it was a great, it was a great little you know, honor to, to those two guys and what yeah. they did for him. Uh, it's always yeah. nice to hear really smart people really acknowledging other smart people who got him there, right. Or helped get yeah. him there. I thought and that's cool. the poet because he taught, that's you great. know, the whole book is, you know, in fact, regardless of what the hell loop quantum gravity theory is time for us is about moments with our friends and our family, nostalgia, the passing of time, the absence, distance, spending time with people, not spending time with people. That's what really matters. 
It, it's cool that somehow he worked that into a chapter yeah. that tried to explain loop loop theory. I thought it was awesome. Um, Do you think that even maybe himself? Oh my god, I've got to try and explain loop theory. I know I'll go off here instead. That's right. Yeah, the, you know, they press the easy button on that. Um, no, the, the, where we started with this chapter, you know, describing a world no with no time, right? Yeah. Describe a world with no time, and I immediately went to because I, I studied uh, flow state for quite a while, and the guy that actually came up with the term flow is a guy named Mihai Csent Mihai, and he defined, you know, first to kind of define flow state. And one of the first pieces of a definition when you're in flow state, flow state's like being in the zone, right? Being in the zone, whether you're yep. snowboarding, whether you're riding, whether you're shooting baskets, whether you're playing music, whatever it is. One of the first qualifiers to his definition is where time disappears. Yeah. Where the, the, the idea of time goes away, which is like, holy cow, like the idea of the world with uh, without time is flow state in in a way just from a personal what does it feel like right but as we get into this it's kind of it kind of talks kind of talks about the fundamental equations of quantum gravity without the time variable so they literally took the time variable out so they took time out of these equations right um and, and he they, says that he says that's in its in the elementary form of the mechanics of the world it does not need to mention time. The world without a time variable is not a complicated one. It's a net of interconnected events where the variables in play adhere to probabilistic rules, which incredibly we know for a good part how to write. Right. Yeah. So they talk about describing a world. This guy, uh, DeWitt and uh, who's Wheeler. Wheeler and Wheeler and DeWitt. Right. And Wheeler's been I've heard a lot about John Wheeler over over the years, just in relation to, to all of this stuff. Uh, DeWitt was relatively new to me, but the idea of describing the world by indicating these possible relations between variable quantities. Okay, so possible relations between variable quantities. The variable quantities, this is where the probability comes into the equation, right? The probability, which is everything. Everything is a cloud of probability from an electron to to these spin networks that he talks about right all of these little micro events that happen are probabilistic right that create the bigger things that we see we just can't see the little probabilities that that are the root of them which is like mind-blowing have you got a, got a formula for that yeah i'm i was kidding about the formulas but <laughs> right. no so so the idea too all right so it's it's not how things evolve in time it's how things change one in respect to others right so it's this these relations between things whether they're two quarks with one spin up and one spin down or whether they're uh protons and electrons or or whatever it is atoms there are how do, what is one thing doing in relation to another thing at that particular moment and uh that's kind of this simple structure of the equation they're talking about that explains the literally the dynamics of the world like that's a that's pretty powerful man the fields manifest themselves in granular form elementary particles photons and quanta of gravity or rather quanta of space so this little quote was i loved this part because i fooled myself into believing i understood what it meant these elementary grains do not exist immersed in space rather they themselves form that space the spatiality of the world consists of the web of their interactions they do not dwell in time they interact incessantly with each other and indeed exist only in terms of these incessant interactions and this interaction is the happening of the world. It is the minimum elementary form of time that is neither directional nor linear, nor does it have the curved and smooth geometry studied by Einstein. It is a reciprocal interaction in which quanta manifest themselves in the interaction in relation to that with which they interact. Beautiful. It, re it really is. And, and you're thinking about like, I'm putting my hand like all around me here and here. It's not... There's nothing, there's not nothing there. Space isn't the absence of something. Space is the space is the shit we can't see that makes space. Like the fields that are around us that make photons, that make matter, that make electrons are all out there. We just don't have the sensory perception to understand that they are there. Imagine if we did, like, what does that look like? What I mean, you're just walking around looking at looking at fields and lines and stuff and 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 maybe the reason maybe the reason we can't see them because it'd be too much for our brains to handle i don't know it'd be overwhelming isn't that why our vision is 
so terrible because if we could actually see everything that was going on around us, you just would just sit in a corner and cry because there were just too much stimuli. Um, so so yeah. what? All right. So what's the bot? What's the bottleneck? Our brain's ability to to process all of this stuff is that is that the bottleneck? Yes. He says I'm confidently. I'm trying to I'm trying to lock you into a yes or no. All right. So all right. A couple other things real quick before we wrap wrap this this seven and eight here. Uh, the world is a, is a collection of interrelated points of view, right? That talks about just networks of things happening with a certain probability, right? Um, but talking about it from a point of view is really interesting, right? Interrelated points of view. And going beyond that, going beyond that, <laughs> this was pretty cool too. What we don't see what I talked about space being right space being all around us, but we don't really see the details of the space. Uh, space is things that we can't see frenzy frenzied swarming of quanta that appear and disappear. So there's just like, there's just like shit appearing and disappearing all around us, but we aren't aware of that. And that appearing and disappearing creates the reality that we, that we see on your time in my time, because there's no coordinated time. It's Mark's time and Jeremy's time. Mark's present. Jeremy's present, Mark's past, Jeremy's past. Um, yeah. And and on that note, we'll see you next week for the next part of The Order of Time by Carlo Rovelli, where uh, part three is called The Sources of Time. Time is ignorance. Ignorance so, is bliss. So remember, so remember, there are no, there's no space, no time is what he said. And they're only events and relations. Events and relations. No space, no time. Yeah, and on that note, don't have nightmares. Stay, stay disruptive. <laughs> stay curious. Keep thinking on paper. We'll see you next week.